Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on MovieHouseMemories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Our little Jedi Council is back to review one of the infamous Star Wars films. This is One with the Force, the MHN podcast review of the Star Wars film series. I'm Patrick. I'm Chris. I'm Lori. Hi, I'm Shane A. And Shane's been away for a while. Shane, welcome back. Yes, I could fit this one in. <laughs> yeah. thankfully, thankfully, with our time differences. And we're in luck because I'm, I'm a big fan of The Last Jedi. Yeah. I, have you not been around since Empire? <laughs> no, did I do Jedi? I cannot remember. Actually. I know Jedi was just we, Chris and I. I'm pretty sure. Uh, we've been uh, we were sort of started so early doing these, um, and they were so <laughs> spread out. I can't remember, but it's good to be back. <laughs> and and we're actually recording. At least Lori and Chris and I are actually recording this on May the fourth. So may the fourth be with you. <laughs> Thank you. I and celebrated also, that yesterday. <laughs> and also with you. <laughs> All right. Uh, and what did you do for May the 4th, uh, Shane? Uh, I did a bit of extra work across the radio stations because they all wanted my take on what movies are best and worst and when I first saw Star Wars and what it means to me and experiences I've had in the theatre and just things like that. So basically all I did was sit in isolation on the phone talking to various radio stations around the country. And I watched this one again, including all the extra features on my three-disc <laughs> Blu-ray. And Laurie, what did you do to celebrate May the 4th? I watched The Last Jedi, and I watched The Rise of Skywalker, and I played games with my family, and we listened to Star Wars, the best of Star Wars. <laughs> and Chris? I had the enjoyable task of working. You and I both, but I received annoying text messages all day long from this guy named Chad who was complaining about all these people talking about May the 4th. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I would like to say that I was also working. I got paid to give my views on radio yesterday. Yeah, but no one wanted to hear my views on Star Wars at my job. That's unfortunate. You got to actually talk and do some fun. <laughs> I don't think it's very relevant to your job. <laughs> no. Uh, however, I was watching the uh, Family Guy Star Wars parodies with my kids because they they enjoy those, even though they're still inappropriate for nine-year-olds and five-year-olds but they laugh their, their asses off watching that show uh anyway i stopped at um i stopped at the first one with the family guy parodies i haven't watched the others i just couldn't i didn't get it didn't laugh <laughs> I, I actually like family guy so i'm bizarre in that way all right well let's get on to uh our next I, review i think a lot of people do <laughs> i don't think you're alone <laughs> yeah Let's get into our review of Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi, uh, the penultimate uh, episode or film uh, of the Star Wars series, at least to date, and at least of our podcast to this point in time. Uh, we usually start off by talking about the trailers, and there was really only two official trailers for this film when it came out. And we'll start with the uh, teaser trailer. Uh, Chris, uh, what did you think of the teaser trailer on this one? It was decent. It was pretty much all about Ray, I think, um, and the the hints with uh, Luke Skywalker, and uh, it was okay. It wasn't anything exciting to me. Lori, I forgot to watch the trailers. I'm gonna have to take myself <laughs> out. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem, <laughs> Shane. Did you? I know you just said you watched all the extras. Did you watch the trailers? Yeah, yeah, of course. I'll, I'll make up for Laurie because I did watch them both a couple of times. Uh, I really like them both. So that's a spoiler. But this teaser was pretty good. And I remember it at the time seeing it at the cinema and it got my blood pumping. I was very excited. Uh, the teaser trailer, uh, you know, as much as like the last episode when Chris and Laurie and I talked about how the Force Awakens trailers were universally pretty much really, really good, the kind of the, the gold standard for film trailers, 
uh, this trailer didn't really excite me that much. Uh, it had a really good end that caused me to be very interested in what this film was about with uh, Luke saying it's time for the Jedi to end. Uh, that caught my fascination. Um, but the rest of it, I felt, was a kind of uneventful or unexciting. It just was, you know, it was very much was teasing, uh, but it just it didn't give me much to sink my teeth into as far as like scenes from the film. I, I saw it as a lot of uh, filler and, you know, throwaway scenes that are very uh, not, not driven by special effects. So I, I did not care for the teaser trailer, although I didn't think it was bad. I just didn't think for the teaser trailer was as good as what was going on in The Force Awakens. And then we had the theatrical trailer that was, it debuted on a Monday night football game. Uh, I remember it specifically because when it debuted, I was in Disney World at the time and actually stopped. We were in a restaurant and watched the trailer on the television during Monday night football. Shane? I find it really difficult to avoid trailers online now. I mean, there was a time where you wouldn't see a trailer it, it until – on the big screen before you saw a movie you wouldn't get to see it online first or early obviously things have changed and i do force myself to watch not everything but i just watch trailers online and i remember seeing this one i think i just knew when it was coming there was like a countdown for it um and i watched it and really enjoyed it as much as i liked it watching it again to talk about now that the color red is prominent i like seeing the at ats and just just in general I mean, they were both really good trailers, the teaser and this main one. Well, I thought this was much better. It was probably, I would say, the second best of the sequel trilogy trailers. I, I thought it was visually stunning. And pretty much anything Ryan does is is very visually stunning. He's got a great cinematographer. And this Agreed. one was... He, he, this was edited very well. So um, it didn't get me excited to see the film because, uh, to be honest with you, I had burnout uh, for Star Wars by this point. But I, I definitely acknowledge that this is one of the best Star Wars trailers that have been made. All right. Uh, hey, hey, Patrick, yeah. before you go on, um, the restaurant you're in, did they like did the manager tell everyone to be quiet and they turned the volume up for the trailer? Uh, it, we, the, the television was already pretty loud anyways. Uh, oh, okay. I, I can't, I'm trying to remember what restaurant we were specifically in in Disney World, but there were televisions everywhere. You're yeah. probably in Star Trek land. They don't <laughs> turn the shit up for Star Wars at all. The ESPN zone. So, no, we were not at the ESPN <laughs> zone, So, uh, which would have made sense because ESPN has the Monday Night Football games. But uh, it was – I mean, it, it, there was a general – a lot of the audience stopped and turned and watched uh, what was going on on the television for a couple of moments. The, it was, I, I know it was the Bears who were playing because it was at Soldier Field, but I don't remember who they were playing in the game. But I don't remember. The, the game does not sound, is, is not remem- memorable to me, just the, the trailer itself. <laughs> well, you know, I, I like this trailer. Still, once again, not as fond of it as I, I thought the Force Awakens trailers were. I thought those were really, really good, solid trailers. As you guys said, the visual style was stunning. I really liked the the, the visualization. Um, I once again, I think throughout the sequel trilogy, they do a really really good job of trying to misdirect to a certain extent. Uh, even uh, the having the last scene of Ray saying she's trying to find her place in all this, and having Kylo Ren extend his hand out uh, very two distinctively different scenes, um, but the kind of implying a potential storyline for the film. And I really, you know, in hindsight, after seeing the film, uh, Mark Hamill's line of this is not going to go the way you think uh, is, I I think, was kind of a warning to the audience (laughs) itself uh, of what this film was going to be and what everyone's expectations were. Uh, So I I think that they did a really outstanding job of, uh, you know, misdirecting, giving some ideas of what the story was, but not really giving much of the plot away. Uh, I I don't think they gave anything of real significance away in the plot line of this trailer. Not really at all. No. So, and and that in this day and age, that's some, that's just, that's something to be said because I think a lot of trailers give away far too much of the movie in the trail in their theatrical trailers right before the film comes out. All right, well, that brings us to the summary of the film. And Chris, do you have a summary for us? It begins in a world. (laughs) Yeah, I do. Can you tell me a story? Our film starts with General Leah Organa's resistance fleet fleeing 
the car when the first order shows up. Ooh. Poe and his team have a counterattack against the fleet, which is costly, but they destroy a first order dreadnought. I guess it was worth losing every single one of their bombers in the fight. The resistance makes their leap into hyperspace to escape, but uh uh-oh, the First Order tracks them. Something never done before in a Star Wars film. Kylo Ren holds his fire on the resistance ship when they attack some more, sensing his mother's presence on board. However, time fighters just swoop in around him and destroy the bridge, killing Admiral Akbar in a very quick maneuver. And they knock Leah out into space where she Mary Poppins the shit out of herself and gets right back inside. Uh, We find that Poe dislikes the Vice Admiral Haldo, so he sets out a little side adventure that makes no sense. Him and his team are going to uh, disable the tracking device, and they need uh, Finn, BB-8, and Rose Tico. As this encounter goes on, Ray lands on Achu with Chewbacca and R2-D2 where Luke Skywalker lives in a self-imposed exile. Luke refuses to help Rey and wants the Jedi Order to end. Inexplicably, really. As Rey and Kylo chat with each other through the Force, R2-D2 uses a sneaky little trick to persuade Luke to train Rey. Kylo tells Rey that Luke tried to kill him, so he went to the dark side of the Force. Luke mentions that he thought about it, but... He felt guilty, so he didn't do it. You can pick which of the two you want to believe. Ray knows Kylo is redeemable, is redeemable, so she leaves Luke to his solitude. As Luke prepares to burn down the little Jedi temple on Achu, Yoda's ghost appears and does it for him. He then encourages Luke yet again to learn from his failure, because that's all Luke ever's done. Learn from his failures. Meanwhile, back in space, Haldo plans to evacuate the resistance in small transports. Poe pouts and leads a mutiny. Finn, Rose, and BB-8 are still on that pointless side adventure and travel to Canto Blight Casino. There, the the hacker DJ says he can help them disable the tracking device. They manage to get on Snoke's ship, but Captain Phasma captures all of them except BB-8. Ray shows up to save the day, but Kylo catches her and brings her to Snoke. Snoke says he's the real reason she and Tylo can talk to each other through the Force, as part of a plan to destroy Luke. He orders Kylo to kill Ray, but Kylo kills Snoke instead. Ray believes Kylo's actions have turned him back to the light side of the Force, but instead, Kylo asks Ray to rule the galaxy with him in his little black heart. Ray politely declines. They force fight for possession of Anakin's lightsaber, but it breaks in two. Finally, Leah recovers from her little spacewalk, and she stuns Poe by allowing the evacuation of the ship and ruins his little mutiny. Haldo remains on board to hold off Snoke's fleet. DJ tells the First Order of the Resistance plan, which which leads them to the destruction of the uh, space transports that were cloaked. Haldo rams her ship into Snoke's fleet at light speed, and according to all the lemmings, breaks Star Wars forever. <laughs> ever and ever. It destroys everything in its path. Rey escapes in the chaos, uh, chaos and Kylo declares himself supreme leader. Uh, BB-8 frees Finn and Rose once they take out Phasma, and they all head to Crate. The First Order arrives, and Poe and Finn and Rose attack on using some old speeders, Ray and Chewbacca take on TIE fighters in the Falcon to draw far away from the resistance. Rose talks Finn out of kamikaze the enemy siege cannon that penetrates the resistance fortress by ramming him, his, his speeder, and knocking him out. Luke suddenly appears and takes on the First Order to give the surviving resistance members time to escape. They return their fire on Luke, but it has no effect. Kylo then jumps down to take on Luke, mano y mano, in a lightsaber duel. When Kylo swings at Luke, he dodges him, but eventually he realizes that Luke has duped him and that he's been fighting a force projection. While Rey helps the Resistance escape on the Millennium Falcon, Luke becomes one with the force back on Ach2. 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 Uh, Rey. Ach2. 
Octu. Ray and Leah sense his death in the force. Leah and the surviving resistance members return from their losses back at Canto Bight. A child that helped Finn and Rose escape grabs a broom with the force and gazes into space as our new hope. The end. Yay! All right. Numbers on The Last Jedi. Uh, released on December 15th, 2017, the same day as the animated film Ferdinand and the kind of adult comedy Youth with Harvey Keitel. The same month as Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle, Hidden Figures, Sing, I, Tanya, The Shape of Water, and The Great Showman. Uh, was uh, made on a budget of $317 million, which is the most expensive Star Wars film, at least to date. It grossed over $620 million in the domestic box office in the United States, making it the highest grossing film of 2017. Grossed $1.33 billion in worldwide box office that year, making it the highest grossing film uh, in, worldwide. Uh, the domestic gross unadjust, unadjusted for inflation makes it the second highest grossing Star Wars film behind The Force Awakens and right in front of Rogue One and worldwide gross is the second highest grossing film behind The Force Awakens and right in front of The Rise of Skywalker. Adjusted for inflation, it's the sixth highest grossing Star Wars film of all time, right behind The Phantom Menace and right in front of Rogue One. It was nominated for four Academy Awards, winning none. Best visual effects, it lost to Blade Runner 2049. Best original score, lost to Alexander Desplat for The Shape of Water. And Best Sound Editing and Best Sound Mixing lost both of those Academy Awards to Dunkirk. Rotten Tomatoes has it at 91% critics and 43% audience. And that is the numbers on The Last Jedi. Uh, Pretty sure that's a legit 43% on Rotten Tomatoes. No, actually, I think that there, there was it was well documented at the time that there mm-hmm. was they were going out of their way to sync the numbers on it to yeah. kind of give the finger to Disney at the time. So I think that's why you have the huge discrepancy. But... Uh, let's get into uh, the discussion of Last Jedi, starting with our memories of when we first saw the film. And Chris, I know you're going to have to go way back for you. I think all the way to Saturday, to, to yeah, <laughs> just two days ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the thing: um, in this time since uh, between the Force Awakens and the Last Jedi, I, I said this on the last podcast that. I would watch The Force Awakens and I would always turn it off at the same spot when Ray and BBA just go off into the desert alone. And that was enough for me. I, everything else was the same old familiar crap and it just didn't interest me. So as the, the years rolled by and the, the, the trailers came out, I was just like, eh, if I see it, I see it. If I don't, I don't. And so I decided I was just going to do a wait and see attitude. And then when everybody started bitching about it, um, I'm like, well, it's probably not a hundred percent valid because I know how these fans are. Uh, you could give them 100% what they want and they would still bitch that it's not what they wanted. But, um, so I, I just didn't see it until two days before we recorded this, which is in 2020. So I, I did not see it, did not care to see it, did not miss seeing it. I saw it and I'm like, eh, all right, I saw it. I don't need to see it again. <laughs> All right, Lori. Do you have at least a little more positive experience than that? I have a very positive experience. I saw it with my family and some good friends at a midnight showing. And it was one of it, it. So that's when the diehard fans are there. And, you know, as soon as the lights go out, they start cheering. As soon as the music goes on, they start cheering. It was just it was another fun Star Wars audience. I love to go to the midnight showings of the of the star wars movies for that reason shane what about you uh disney australia had invited me to a, a, an event which was it for media and i saw it i think it was only i can't remember the exact date i think it was three days before the actual release but like laurie i did see it again because i had tickets for a midnight screening at my local cinema and um with the fans i mean it was still good with the media friends and family all my colleagues and so forth around the Sydney area, but um, seeing it with a fans in the cinemas itself, you know, like it's just totally different experience. Uh, I remember it well because I re- was one of the few that really enjoyed it, but there was some grumblings on the way out. Yeah, I remember you hinting that this was going to be a challenging Star Wars film. 
Yeah, I remember not because I don't wouldn't want to spoil anything, but I think I did say something to you or the MHM friends or something. Whoever yeah. it was, I just didn't want yeah. to make people make the decision before they see it because no. yeah, people were yeah. starting to comment about it before embargo. Yeah, you you uh, you. I think your specific statement was you didn't give any details away. You said you were very curious to see what our reactions were going to be from the film because it is not not what you th- I think you imply guys I don't think it's what you think is you're going to see in the f- what you expect to see in the film exactly and I don't know what it was like with Laurie your um, audience but the excitement was so intense and high when it starts and the hairs on the back of my neck always stand up when the music comes on and people are cheering and, and that just goes on it's just so good but as the movie went on you could tell there was people starting to be deflated slowly so that's what i would have meant by that comment mm-hmm. i unlike most star wars films i didn't see this on opening day or the midnight showing on like force awakens where i went on the thursday night at like nine thirty, saw it by myself i didn't see it until like the sunday of the weekend went with my son my nephew and my parents um who are all big star wars fans and uh I, I, I'll say I enjoyed it. Uh, my son thought it was a little long and was kind of disappointed about Luke, which we'll get into. And then my parents were really kind of disappointed because they are true original se- series you know, fans. And knowing that Carrie Fisher has already passed away and Harrison Ford's character had been killed and now Luke Skywalker has been killed, they were very much like, okay, who's left for us to really cheer for in the last film? So they were a little disappointed in it. But uh, I the the audience I saw it was 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 pretty energetic. I, I didn't I didn't get the feeling that there was a lot of unhappy people at the time until I went home and started reading about people's criticisms of it because I avoided it for a few days and I was kind of taken back by a, a lot of that. But uh, let's I guess we could start by getting into kind of the some of the backlash of this film um, and I'm going to be jumping out of order from my talking points so um, that I, I think this is this is a very unique film as far as the criticism I've heard uh, that many people were immensely disappointed in this because they had a preconceived notion of what this film was going to be about. It was uh, the the heyday of Luke Skywalker and seeing his mastery of the Force and kind of leading the forces, uh, and then they didn't get that. Um, that basically they got you know where the force awakens was very much about fan service and giving some something a kind of a regurgitated a familiar storyline with story elements was in a in slightly new way to get you excited again i always saw the last jedi as something that you went off in a completely different direct, direction and charged, tried to challenge the fans of Star Wars in a way that, by giving them something completely unexpected completely unknown before However, then there was another element of people saying this is still just the same old kind of Star Wars, that there's a lot of retread of the elements of Empire Strikes Back uh, in Last Jedi, you know, talking about uh, trying to convert the good Jedi, this case Rey, to the the dark side, Um, the fact that they're um, making hasty evacuations from a rebel base, you know, training of an inexperienced Jedi by an, an elder Jedi, on and on and on. But it seems to go, to me, it's like this really interesting dichotomy of either it's the same old shit or it's so completely different that I hate it, but it, how can they be both things? And, and that's what I think is an interesting, the dichotomy of the criticism. Uh, Lori, what did you think of it? I know you are a diehard Star Wars fan and pretty much will like al- almost like everything that comes out. I do. Um, I liked it. I do. We did have a big discussion about it afterwards. My friend group was split. There are a couple of my friends that really disliked it. and But they're people that have really strong opinions, and they usually find something they don't like in every movie. But it's like a with one of our friends. It's kind of a, a sore um, point that we're always like, oh, don't bring up The Last Jedi with him. Because he gets real animated about how he did. A lot like of it. people are like that, though. For some yeah. reason, yeah, they are. Well, because we grew up with Star Wars, right? Yeah, yeah. And and I think that's part of the fan passion, and and that can kind of get to cruelty because they 
really feel like they own these characters and that that they have a right to say how they should so i so, but getting mean i don't agree with but um and, and this person doesn't get mean that i'm talking about but i i liked it i liked that it was different that's funny to me how you pointed out the dichotomy because then that to me says it was kind of successful in bringing something new if two opposing sides weren't happy with it yeah people hated it for a a completely opposite reasons, but united in their hatred of one film. <laughs> <laughs> so at least there's unity <laughs> in some capacity. Uh, Shane, what do you what do you think about that? Uh, I I don't listen to what other people say. I, I give my I've got an open mind and um, I listen to other people's opinions. But honestly, if I like something, I like something. And whether it's rated low or high on something as pitiful as Rotten Tomatoes, I'm not going to take any notice of that. It was good. I mean, there's aspects of the comedic elements that were lost on me, I'll admit. There's certain characters in it that didn't get enough screen time and a little plenty of confusing little bits in the film but overall i i loved it and um yeah i don't like i mean i can mention it now I, if it, I take out the casino scene and the leftover green milk on the beard scene and i'd be happy i'm much happier <laughs> but overall overall i enjoyed it i liked those scenes <laughs> you, uh, uh, L- lily cole um, the, be- the beautiful lily cole has a cameo in the casino scene but other than that 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 green beard the green milk on the beard has always bugged me always <laughs> having had look. green having had green milk at disneyland i appreciate it more <laughs> i thought you were gonna say having had a beard with milk oh, on. So. that too <laughs> did, did you spit it out and drool it on down your 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 chin like he did or <laughs> no it was too good it was so good <laughs> uh chris what are, what are your thoughts about the the controversy as far as either too much of the same shit or too far different from what we expect well, I've said this previously as well. When Lucas first announced that he was going to do a prequel trilogy, all the the diehard fans ever wanted to see was Darth Vader in his glory, in his heyday, being a badass. And George, for all his wisdom, said, no, I'm denying that. I'm going to do it my own way. Fine. Take it or leave it. Uh, accept it or not. When Disney announced that they were going to do the sequel trilogy, all the diehard fans wanted was to see Luke in his heyday, in his glory, using the Force as a master would. Disney, for whatever reason, decided, hey, we're not going to do that. We're going to go our own different way. That's the second time that uh, diehard Star Wars fans had been denied, and they, a lot of them did not accept it. You know, And so now, going forward, these diehard fans need to decide, are they going to continue watching or not? And Disney needs to decide... Was it worth pissing off and alienating all these diehard fans? Did this film bring in a new, enough new fans to replace those fans? And I'm not talking the, the people who bitch daily on Reddit or Twitter and uh, are doing these petitions to get Disney to remake The Last Jedi because they could remake this and give them exactly what they want and they'd still bitch that it's not good. As this, this tells you, the diehard fans say... Uh, that this is too familiar and others say it's too different. You know, that, that you give them what they want, they're going to bitch. They, they just need to decide uh, going forward, was this film worth it for all the that they upset? Hmm. You know, I am of the camp that this was a challenging Star Wars film. It was kind of what Shane implied to me back in the day uh, that when I was watching it, it was it was. I wouldn't say it was fulfilling my expectations, but was challenging me as a viewer that I, when I was expecting one thing, I would usually get something else. And, you know, including, uh, you know, like Leia getting sucked out into space right at the beginning of the film. I went, wow, did they just really kill her character? Because that would have been the logical thought. And then when they Mary Poppins her ass back into the ship, th- that, you know, I, I liked, actually, I had no problem with Leia saving herself using the Force. I liked that idea. I just didn't like the way it pl- portrayed on the screen. Um, I wish they would have done something better with her displaying her Force power for the first time on, can- or on screen in a way that would have been a little bit less hokey, if you will. Have her move the ship towards her. Or... 
use the force like Kylo Ren did in The Rise of Skywalker to hold herself in place in that in the ship without getting sucked out into space. Uh, that would have been better to me in that regard. So, I, as I said, I didn't necessarily dislike the idea of the threat of her being out in space and implying that maybe she died. I just didn't like the even the way the special effect was done. I thought it was pretty pretty cheesy. Uh, you know, it, it, even to the, the aspect of Kylo Ren killing Snoke in the film, when that scene was playing out, I, I was fascinated with what are you, t- where are you taking me on this journey? Because Kylo Ren killed Han Solo. That, to, and even to this point, that character is not redeemable to me because he killed my favorite character in the series. And it was like, how, where are you taking this storyline? And I was I was enthralled at that moment in time in the film as where it was going to go from there. Uh, now they they fell back into some familiar tropes right after that, and I didn't necessarily enjoy or appreciate those those choices they made. But by no means did I walk out of the film like I did with The Force Awakens and say this is just The Empire Strikes Back kind of polished up and changed a little bit i felt it was a completely different film in many many different ways there are some familiar story beats but not enough to say that this is just a redo of empire uh and so uh i i liked the film for that i thought it was very very challenging and i was very much looking forward to what they were going to do with rise of skywalker or at least episode nine as we knew it at that point because of the differences and the decisions they made in this particular film now, uh, going on from that aspect that Ryan Johnson, the director, writer and director of this film, he did he did not use the uh, story outline that apparently J.J. Abrams and uh, Lawrence Kasdan left for him after The Force Awakens. In fact, the, uh, what I found very amazing about this is uh, that he got to essentially do whatever he wanted with this film within some reason um, and not there was no overarching plan or idea of where these characters were going to end with episode 9 in fact to the point that the director of episode 9 and oh gosh I'm, I'm blanking on his name Shane the director of Jurassic World Colin Colin, Colin Trevorrow Trevorrow, yeah. Yeah. Backed out of the project of episode nine because he wanted to use Luke, didn't want Luke killed in this film. And when Luke was dead, it kind of changed his whole plan. It just ruined his whole idea of what he was going to do in episode nine. And so he left the project requiring Disney to run back to to the drawing board to find a new director and eventually coming up with J.J. Abrams. What I mean, what do you think of that idea, Shane, that with with these epic length films these uh, obviously tentpole films for a studio that they were approaching these as a film by film project and not really having kind of an overarching idea that we're going to this is where the characters are going to get begin and end in the series uh, the overarching idea is probably what they should have stuck with uh, as you put it but i'm glad they went with someone like ryan johnson who is totally outside the box i do enjoy his previous movies but you know they need new ideas and i think the fact they swayed away from um, jj and lawrence for this one helped it helped it i mean again it's different it's not what people expected but they get they get spoon-fed star wars stuff left right and center that's why it, it upset so many people because it was different and like i said i don't think it was perfect by any means but I, I like what they've done, and the producer Kathleen Kennedy, isn't it? She she is so strong towards Ryan. And if you look at some of the extra the bonus features on the disc I've got, the Blu-ray I've got, she's nothing short of praise before, during, and after production. So she's got the ability to put a foot down and get things cut out and change things and cancel and. Uh, delete people out of the off the scene completely by firing them like the solo project for instance directors there but I, I like it Patrick I like that they don't just didn't go from A to Z they mixed it up well it has its pluses and minuses on, on yeah. the plus side they gave us uh, something very um, different and uh, pretty much breathe new life or sucked it out depending on your point of view of star Wars. Uh, the downside is he killed off pretty much all of the, the main characters 
And you could see in the third film that that hampered them dramatically, especially since Disney turned chicken and didn't go forward with Ryan. You know, one of the themes in uh, this film uh, that they kind of, well, they didn't really ram down our throat, but it was a main theme was people failing, learning from your mistakes, and what you do with that from there determines on whether you're going to succeed, succeed or fail in the future. And it happened for every character, and unfortunately, it happened for Disney. You know, they did not have a plan um, for the three films, which Lucas never had a, a plan necessarily for all three of his. But when you're going to go from extreme to extreme to extreme for all three episodes, you better be sure that um, you're talking to each other a little bit more so you can get a little bit more cohesive and have a, a successful beginning, middle and end over the overall sequel trilogy and we will learn when we review the next one that it hampered them tremendously and to be perfectly honest with you i don't think jj abrams is a very good writer and i think ryan johnson is an excellent writer and it shows going from force awakens to last jedi to rise of skywalker although i'm sure there was a lot of input on disney's part freaking out over the rise of skywalker I disagree. I I think it it is cohesive, and I liked the Rise of Skywalker a lot. I, I don't want to talk about it now, but um, I really like J.J. Abrams too. And I I don't know. I I didn't have complaints with his versions. I know a lot of people did, but I don't think you were going to be able to please everyone. I think people were going to be Absolutely unhappy. Not no matter what. And I'm with Shane. I don't listen to what critics or other people say. I just watch it and if I like it. And I liked it. And I liked it even more watching it again today, I think, than I than I did before because I caught more things that I wasn't so involved in trying to figure out what was going on and just was able to enjoy it. Um, so I I really liked it. I really liked, yeah, I, I liked everything about it. All right, well... One of the criticisms of the film was this sudden expansion of force powers and force powers specifically in kind of this, I don't, other than astral projection, if you will, of the, the visualization of Ray and Kylo Ren being able to communicate with each other, uh, Kylo expressing that, that, that ability should, uh, like kill Ray. Um, she, she's not that powerful and is wondering how she, she does it throughout the remainder of the film. But that became not only a major story plot or element to this film, but also another major element and a a crucial story element to Rise of Skywalker in the next film, when Snoke is no longer around to assist them in communicating them. Chris, what did you think of that addition of those powers in this film? It was a little weird. It took some getting used to. Uh, I'm kind of indifferent on it. Uh, I I could go either way. I didn't dislike it. Um, I just wish they wouldn't have used it so much. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think I you know you know a couple times it was fine, but at a certain point I'm like it's like telling a funny joke to somebody uh, over and over and over. And after a while, actually that's not what I'm saying. It's like telling a joke and there's somebody present for each time that they tell it, but they're telling it to a different person each time. And the person who's heard it all these times is kind of like, all right, let's get something new. And, um, and so by the, by the end of the film, I'm like, I, I, I don't like this anymore, but the introduction to it, it was fine. I, I, it's weirder to me in the next film, but for this one, I think it was sufficient. I liked it. Um, <laughs> I just, it was so important to the development of the characters and the plot. And like when he had the the rainwater on his hand, when she um, shot him, I don't know. It was just, I really liked that, that plot twist. And, and to me, you know, the force has endless possibilities. So it seemed realistic to me. Well, he should have left his shirt on. I didn't need to see that. <laughs> that but was a funny did. line. She's like, could you put something on? <laughs> yeah, a towel exactly. or something. Hey, Anakin was shirtless in uh, Attack of the Clones, so why not uh, Kylo? Yeah, yeah I, fair I, enough. I just uh, love different, I different love, builds, though. Those yeah. two bodies are completely different. Hayden Christensen. I, I just love the line. I love the line of, can you put on something, maybe a cowl or something? Like, yeah, that's what all villains wear. It's just cows hanging around. <laughs> Uh, beyond that, the astral projection thing, I'm okay with. 
you know, it, it's an easy way out of some plot lines, though. And I think it kind of worked here, uh, except for that shirtless scene. However, it was a very famous gif for a long time. It reminded me of a 1984 movie called Dreams Come True, where these two people who hadn't met each other ever, a male and a female, they're, they're dreaming, but they meet in their dreams. So that they go out, have you know a good time and date in their dreams, but don't know each other. Then they come across each other in real life and have a connection. So Dreams Come True is what it reminded me of. I've got no problem with it. Uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily have a problem with the use of the powers uh, because much like the, the, the characters of how are you doing this? That's what I'm asking as the audience. So I'm, I'm, I'm okay with the journey, but I, I somewhat agree with Chris is that it becomes really repetitive and becomes in, in my viewpoint, a, a, you know, just a plot device, to be able to create, to create dialogue between these two main characters yeah. uh, throughout the film that I would have, you know, to me, somewhat lazy screenwriting, you know, you couldn't have come up with a better, way of having these two communicate with each other in some form or another just give them two cell phones and let them walk uh, through the whole film on a cell phone (laughs) right they're not gonna hang out well yeah i know but you know that it's if it was so important that you were going to try to bring these two characters together then create a something that naturally flows from the story and i don't and i and i didn't think that it, the power ne- necessarily naturally flowed from the story uh and even when you explained to me that it was snoke who was making that happen uh, i found that unsatisfying especially when he's not even around and rise of skywalker and it's still continuing to happen and it happening to the point where they're almost no explanation correct and that that becomes a little bit of frustration is now you're now you're really treading on my acceptance of these powers uh, <laughs> to the point where you're the rules that you set in the previous film are now just being completely disregarded uh, all over the place and that becomes a little frustrating for me is that but again that's that's um jump starting the plot moving it faster and jj abrams is known for things like that yeah. All right. Well, there was uh, something that was, without a doubt, the uh, kitty element to this film, uh, something that was the, uh, very much in the promotional material. And the thing that my kids most remember this film form for is the Porgs. Lori, what did you think of the Porgs in the film? You know, um, they weren't my favorite creature, but I mean, they were they were cute. And I read that they were needed because the birds that were on that Irish Island were um, protected and so they couldn't remove the birds or anything and it was just easier to CGI and make them porks (laughs) so I thought that was interesting and I thought that was very um, very clever and I they were they were cute but they weren't my that's funny because when I was watching it today I was like I wasn't as in love with them as I become with other little Star Wars creatures (laughs) Uh, I like the Porgs. I, I, I mean, they're, they're just okay. I mean, they're, they're funny. They're there for um, novelty aspects and kids for some another toy to buy. And I didn't mind them. I mean, they get less screen time in The Rise of Skywalker, but this one was pretty good. I enjoyed it. Chewie has a new best friend. <laughs> Chris? If he doesn't want to eat them. <laughs> That was the only good part about him, where he was trying to eat them, and they all the the, the one dead porg's friends were giving him the puppy dog eyes. Well, they uh, nested in the Millennium Falcon. That, probably, that was know. pretty funny too. Yeah. Uh, that that was interesting. The humor in this it was either uh, it was very successful hit or it missed badly. And the the porg in the Millennium Falcon uh, did crack me up. But, you know, in, in these Disney films, well, in any Lucasfilm, it, it's always geared, geared toward what kind of new toy can we sell? Uh, I mean, look at Baby Yoda with the, the yeah, with their, no you know. Yeah, mine so. came yesterday, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so I expect it. Uh, but I was, uh, I did find it funny when I found out uh, the reason uh, that they had to make these porgs, you know, to CGI out the actual birds on the island. That kind of made me laugh. And it was fairly 
in, ingenious. Yeah. I, you know, I was afraid when the Porgs were used in the marketing campaigns and you were seeing them in the trailers that this was going to become a major story element, the Jar Jar Binks, if you will, of potentially of the this film. And the fact that they're just kind of there for whimsy, that they're kind of background and they're not really a plot element or a major story or a major character uh, is what... I liked about uh, liked about the porgs. They're just there. They're they're cute. They're kind of you know lovable to look at. My wife is, has never even watched this film, but she knows exactly what a porg is because she thinks it's cute when they're and she'll watch the scene when it comes on the film, except for the chewy eating them. Uh, but but the rest of it, you know, she just kind of just disregards. She doesn't have any interest in it. And uh, it was they were just there enough. It was just there for whimsy. And I like that aspect of whimsy. It's a whimsy. There's a it's an alien universe. It's an alien we never seen. And you know, it's okay that it was cute. It I had no problem that it was on the the Falcon when they left uh, Octu and and Chewie had to deal with them just running all just, over the ship. I thought that was funny. Uh, well, something else that came back, uh, something we hadn't seen for a while, the return of the Yoda puppet, uh, the force ghost of Yoda coming down. Who did I start the last one? Chris, you spoke last last. So this means Shane starts with Yoda puppet. Well, this was one part of this movie. I had no idea. This was a complete surprise. I wasn't expecting to see Yoda. And um, yeah, it was OK. Well, be it fairly brief. Uh, and the, the moment itself with the... The uh, that was the hut on fire and everything. I didn't realise that the books had been taken, the scrolls had been taken out at that point either. So this was a total surprise for me, and you know it was a, a great callback to the earlier films. I enjoyed it. I liked the puppet, to be honest, better than some of the CGI we got in Attack of the Clones and yeah, exactly um, Revenge of the Sith. So I enjoyed the puppet. Once again, throwback to Empire Strikes Back, where he was the um, testing of Luke and being the uh, the um, what is the word I'm looking for? Mental. Mental. Uh, well, he was. You know, he was acting crazy as no. a kind Conscience? of as. A, I, I don't know if it was conscious, but he was he was being crazy and eccentric kind of to test Luke's patience. Mm. Although I will say that uh, they mirrored that with Luke and the milk that Shane dislikes. Uh, he was kind of being a hermit and acting a little crazy from his solitude <laughs> as well. So oh, there's some you. parallel there. But uh, in general, the the puppet, I liked it. Yeah, I, I you know, the puppet's in it so little. And it's also supposed to be a force ghost. So you're not getting a full, like... A clear body image of it so I, I was not offended by the, the use of the puppet it's very distinguishable from the the CG used in episode 2 and episode 3 uh, I still don't think for something about it why why the Yoda puppet was so magical and so perfect for Empire and doesn't seem to work as well in any of the other films that they choose to use the puppet. I, you know, it's not as bad in, in this one as it was in The Phantom Menace. The Phantom Menace looked like a, a horrible puppet. And I, I, was really, I was really fascinated by the fact that they chose to do it with a puppet in this film. But I like the inclusion of Yoda. I like the dynamic between him and Sky, uh, Luke and kind of him always Luke still being the the pupil to Yoda's master even at this point in their lives Luke needed him and he was there <laughs> it felt right all right well let's get on to a subject that I know uh, is already going to cause tension because we've already off the air to discuss this the the inclusion of Rose Tycho as a character became a focal point of many people's criticism unfairly uh, in many in many people's viewpoints um, that of the character and what she did in the film the fact that the actress uh, happened to be Asian and she was it was a criticism that the, she's being included in the film uh, as as an Asian she's being included in the film just to expand the Star Wars uh, potential audience into uh, Asian markets specifically China where Star Wars has never been that popular and then in general just people not liking the character at all Shane, what do you think of the inclusion of the Rise, uh, Rose, uh, Rise, Rose, a Tycho character in the film? I'm not going to give this too much significant air, air time. Um, I like Kelly Marie Tran. I think she was good in the role. I like the character. I do wish she was used a little bit more in Rise of Skywalker, but we'll get to that. And I 
she does appear in, in a quite long scene during the whole casino moment, which I don't like. And on the DVD, on the Blu-ray, it has like this extended ex, um, chase and casino scene in it. So she, you know... <laughs> I like her. I mean, I don't like that scene, but her, I, I just don't think it's fair, the backlash that she got and the social media rage and just by people who hide behind their um, computers. I just didn't like it at all. And I'm all for Kelly Marie Tran. I think she's wonderful. Well, you know, I think at this point, Disney was trying to hit the Asian market strong. You know, they're opening up their, their new theme park in China, I believe, at the same time. And off of Rogue One, they had three Asian actors as uh, the leads. And then this one, I think they included this actress for that very reason. However, um, she's a delightful person. I mean, I enjoyed her in it. The problem that I personally had was that she was in the scenes that I thought were the weakest of this film, dragged me out of the overall story, and I actually was bored. Uh, I think the, the weakest thing of this film is that damn casino segment which she is a big part of it's just boring and unnecessary i realize that this is part of their theme of everybody in this film is going to go on some sort of event adventure in believing in a cause and they're going to fail at it so i understand that but they they gave too much time to this casino scene and because she was such an integral part of that I think that's why I did not like the character in this film, but um, put her in something else. And uh, I think she was just fine. I don't think that the criticism she got, th- th- there's any merit to that. I think she's an amazing actress and I liked her portrayal of the character and I liked the character. And um, I think she was important to the plot. And I too was disappointed that she wasn't in the rise of Skywalker more, but I believe um, 76 se- seconds. <laughs> I, I read why. And I believe that that's true. And I also, I, I would like to think that she, I think she deserved the role. I don't think she got it because she is Asian and I want more people, more, I, I want more people to get cast and not just have the same. So I don't know. I'd like to think that that's not why they cast her. Is that like documented? I, look, or is that just opinion? I, I think it's probably it's pretty good supposition um, that mm-hmm. Disney over the last 10 years with the expansion of the film industry into China and the uh, that the success you can have in that market is that they're catering to that market. Now, that being said, um, I like the actress. I like the character in the film. I have no problem with Rose Tycho. I agree with Chris to a certain extent. She, it, the weakest elements of the film she's in, but she's not the reason those film those scenes are the weakest. They're just not necessary. No. And I, I, you know, I, I think that you know she carries a huge message in this film, especially after she saves Finn. You know, says you know we're not. You know, but we're not going to win this by, you know, destroying what we hate, but uh, saving what we love. I think that's a really strong message in the film and it comes from that character. So I think she's really essential to this film and she she follows through with her beliefs. Now, it's also an echo to the beginning of the film where Poe went in and killed off all of his bombing team just to take out one dreadnought. And they find out five minutes later, they're still in the same position. So I think that uh, um, th- it's a, a growth of the film overall that that Correct. sacrifice she made. Correct. But if you look back to her sister who sacrifices herself in the scene is that her sister saves the ones that they love literally her sister in that regard rose herself and so that you know that's how they're ultimately going to win so that you have kind of dual dual messages there coming from how you know poe's perspective and as well as her sister's perspective when or page uh when she sacrifices herself to make sure those bombs go off over the dreadnought but uh now uh, i i i think that they went out of their way. I think she's a talented actress. I think she did a great job. Uh, I think they went out of their way to cast, cast an Asian actress so they can diversify the film and potentially expand an audience in a market. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't. It's, I'm more offended when a role requires an Asian actress and you don't cast one, a la Emma Stone in Aloha yes, yes. or Scarlett Johansson in Ghost in the Shell. Uh, you know, <laughs> Tom Cruise. Uh, Tom Cruise. Oh, in what? 
Last Samurai. No, he's supposed to be an American. <laughs> he's supposed to be an American veteran of the Civil War. <laughs> Isn't the Wolverine supposed to be Japanese? No, Wolverine's supposed to be Canadian. Oh. Can I just say, Rose saves Finn. She's got a pretty big scene. Yeah. There. And look, I, don't, I really don't think she was cast because they want more Asian viewers. I mean, Star Wars doesn't need help in Australasia and Asia. They I mean, need, Peter it, and I, yeah, they do. In China, they do. China oh, does they not do well. Help. They do not. I don't know. I mean, Lupita Nyong'o is in this as that Maz character. Her skin, that Maz isn't a African-American character. So you could you, why have Lupita Nyong'o do it then? Well, it, I, I really don't. I think they're they're cast for their ability, not. They're not know. trying to expand into Africa or. Yeah, yeah, any, yeah, well, yeah, Sh- I don't know. Shane, I'm not, not not criticizing criticizing. They're saying, hey, just go pick any Asian actress. I mean, there there are talented, very talented Asian actresses out there, and I think Kelly Marie Tran is one of them by far. I think she did a great job in it, and I too will echo that. I thought she should have had more screen time in Rise of Skywalker, but. This is still a business, and in the last decade, they have added additional Asian characters in a lot of their major films. They, they made Mulan, which at this point in time has still not even been released, for the sole purpose of, you know, we're going to be a huge hit in China. They added the, I can't even remember the doctor's name, in Age of Ultron, uh, the scientist in uh, from China, they added that entire storyline for because they wanted to expand in the Chinese market. I mean, that's what... The- the, yeah, that was the early days of... or the earlier days of Marvel. And, and um, yeah, this is Star Wars. It's different. Well, I mean, yeah, well, but it, it's not different. It's still a business. And as I said, I'm not offended by it. I, I'm, I'm really, really not offended by the idea that, hey we would like to get an Asian actress to play this because there's no, there's no reason it can't be anybody in a star Wars film. As I said, I am more offended when it's supposed to be one race and you don't go and get someone from that race and cast someone completely against type for the sole purposes of you want to create box office money that way. That offends me more that way. I think that's more insulting in that regard. You know, she, she did a great job in it and she drew unnecessary criticism. She's not the fault of this film. If, if there's any fault to be laid, um, it, I would say it's the fault of the editing. They should have cut this down by about 20 minutes, maybe taken out almost the entirety of the Mm -hmm. uh, casino planet because I just don't I agree with Chris it bogs down in that area of the film just overwhelmingly so but I I, she I mean she got just uh, you know ravaged on on you know social media at, to the point where she was chased off a lot of things and that's unfortunate because you know the, those trolls out there who have such hatred for this film hatred for that character when it's so unnecessary hatred for mm-hmm. themselves well, I guess Daisy Ridley too left i think instagram for a while because of comments rude comments so i i just don't know why people have to yeah i mean be that way you don't like the film that's fine there are many films i don't like and i go on a podcast from time to time don't personally attack people and i say i don't like them and i and i've been pretty brutal against people like sean young and kim basinger uh, trying to daryl hannah you know they're actresses i just don't like shelly duvall yeah, you know, Shelley Duvall, but you know it's it, it, it you know it's in a professional criticism. I'm not going to go out and post it on there and to to ravage them in that way. It's I, I have disagreements on their cho- the choice in acting or their characterizations, and and in this particular case, I think that she drew unnecessary criticism because people were angry with this film, angry in a way that I, I, I as, as Chris said is that they'll never be satisfied with anything that they they so personalize the Star Wars films. And they and they so take take ownership in them that when someone has a different perspective on what should happen in the films or how how they should be made or how characters should act, that they get really, really defensive about it. And instead of just enjoying the film for what it is, and it's just a movie and I love these movies and I am much like Lori, I'm a lifelong fan that I will whatever Star Wars film comes out, I will be there very likely opening weekend and even if I'm slightly disappointed in the film, I'm probably going to like it mo- better than more of than most other films that come out. I just enjoy the, that the, this universe of characters. She pretty much became uh, Ahmed Best as Jar Jar. You know, they, they, that's there was just one person. Fans focused all their hatred towards, as you said, and she became Jar Jar. 
All right, we're going to put a pin in our conversation and uh, come back on the 23rd of this month and finish off our discussion of The Last Jedi. Thanks again for joining us and listening to our little monthly podcast. If you've had a good time, the fun does have to stop here. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram at MHM Podcast Network or on Pinterest or Twitter at MH Memories. On any one of those social media outlets, you can keep informed about our occasional written film reviews and film summaries, news on upcoming theatrical releases and trailers, and information on many upcoming podcasts on the MHN Podcast Network. And if you've enjoyed yourselves and you download us off either iTunes, Android, Google Play, Stitcher, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or any other streaming service, make sure to rate our podcast on your chosen platform. And if you have a chance, write a short review of the podcast. Of course, we always like the reviews that are positive, but we appreciate any feedback that we can get from any listeners of the show. Until the 23rd, when we come back and finish our conversation, I'm Patrick. I'm still Chris. I'm Lori. I'm Shane A. And we'll see you all next time at our house. This podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The theme music for One with the Force Volatile Reaction is provided courtesy of Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the MHM Podcast Network, One with the Force, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment LLC, unless otherwise noted. <laughs>